This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Damn, where does time fly when you're having fun? 900 episodes. What the F? Started this in early 2012? It's 2020? I'm somewhere in parts unknown. A little reverence to Mr. Bourdain. Rest in peace. 900 episodes. Yeah, yeah, Joe Rogan's got me beat, but Joe's making a boatload of money off his podcast. I'm going to have to switch it off to video at some point in time. It's just a lot of damn work. I would love to hear an interview with Joe about doing the video all the time. I mean, producing a show on video versus producing a show on a podcast, light years difference. A podcast is easy if you got good guests. If the host is, you know, maybe somewhat competent, maybe not completely off his rocker, then maybe you got something. But damn, that video stuff, I don't know how people do it. I mean, I know how they do it. You get the setup. This is why Joe has the studio. He just rolls in, hangs out with his buddies or other guests that become his buddies, and you turn the cameras on. It's a great setup, but it's a lot of damn work. I give Rogan all the credit in the world. It ain't easy. Now, I'm not saying 900 podcast episodes with a gazillion different guests of all different types of expertise is easy either, but it gets easier. There becomes a certain rhythm to talking to people. I remember starting only with trading guests and then flipping to everybody under the sun. I like to tell the story and I tell it on this podcast all the time. Once Daniel Kahneman said yes, the Nobel Prize winning psychologist, that for me was... I can ask anybody because if I can get Kahneman to come on, hell, the worst that somebody can say to me is no, F you, Mike, I'm not coming on. That doesn't bother me at all. I could care less. I mean, I could care in the sense that if I ask somebody, that means I want to have them. But if they say no, I still sleep like a damn baby. My guest today is a longtime friend. I believe I sat down with him for the first time in his house in 2005. Central Park South, Larry Height. He might have been Central Park on the west side when I first met him, and then he moved. Larry is a trader. Larry was first featured in Jack Schwager's Market Wizards, one of those voices along with Ed Sakota that you just don't forget. Even before you hear his voice in person, his thinking, his writing on the page, you don't forget. And that first Market Wizards book, all the credit to Jack and his traders that he found and put together. That's a classic. And Larry's right in there. Now, I've also featured Larry in some of my books, Trend Following, The Little Book of Trading. He was in my film, Broke the New American Dream. He's been on this podcast many times. I did a forward for his first book last year called The Rule. And he happens to be my guest number 900 today. Now, we actually did this conversation on Zoom, but both of us were kind of set up bad. So we have some video, but we both look kind of out of it. So I think all you're going to get is some audio. But like Larry does every time, there's that nugget. There's that way that he says something where you just walk away saying, okay, I'm inspired. If he can do it, I can do it. Maybe you don't get the Larry Height success. Maybe you get close. Maybe you don't get close. It doesn't matter. It's the wisdom. You take the wisdom, you take a shot, and that's all you can do. Because if you don't take a shot, what do you got? You're just somebody sitting around talking at the bar. Some bullshitter. So damn it, turn on the headphones, turn on the podcast, whatever you do to listen. And give my guest number 900, Larry Height, a little bit of attention. I hope you enjoy this conversation.
Let me start you off today, though. You're not 18. I'm not 18. But I talk to a lot of young people. A lot of young people, they come on my social media. Their attitude, sometimes I can feel this kind of negative attitude. And I kind of look at it like, if you're alive, you got a chance to do something. So the question I have from you right at the start, why such a good attitude? Why do you have a good attitude? Because my grandmother, my father's father, my father's mother had a good attitude. And it came from her to my father to me. And more importantly, the only sensible, skip the curse word, the F thing to do is be positive. Because let's say you're so negative, you never try. If you never try, you got a 100% chance of failing. This goes from picking up girls to getting into school, zero trying, zero result. If you are inept, as you know I was as an athlete, as you know I was, had dyslexia, when you try, you have better than a zero chance. And that's the only logical way to go. I don't know. You tell me these stories about you not being an athlete. How do I know they're not true? You could have been some star New York City track guy. I don't know. You're just kind of making up these stories 60 years later that you weren't a star. I was less than a star. No, it's just, I'm not writing this book, but I've been going around talking to people. Yesterday, I talked to the guy who was a major hockey player since he was seven. And then from a young age, he was somebody colleges looked at. He was in a car. The car had a head-on collision. His best friend died, broke vertebrae in his back. So I went to see this guy because I'm interested in why, how did he come back? What made him come back after that? He had an attitude. He knew that if he didn't try, he'd have nothing. I once told you the story that this guy, I told you about Harry. All Harry would do was walk up to really good looking girls, say, Harry and I seem to have jobs of no account. We left late. Only Harry left with a beautiful girl. And I left with either my girlfriend at the time or nothing. Give more weight into nothing than a beautiful girl. Harry and I became friends. Days of marijuana. I could get marijuana cheaper, so we became friends. I said, how do you get these beautiful women. Now I'm like 28. And he says, oh, every time I see a gorgeous woman, I go up to her and say, my name's Harry. Let's have coffee. Then he said, Larry, one of the 10 who go to coffee wind up again, one out of a sleeping over. Now, to a 28-year-old horny kid, these are my two favorite subjects, sex and probabilities. I really began to understand my grandmother because if you don't try, you get zero. If you try, you can do very well. That, to me, is not a positive attitude but a practical attitude. So many people think of trying in their head, failing in their head, and do nothing. Correct. But where does that get you? Nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I figured the odds. Being, you know me, I then 
started off with beautiful girls. I remember the first beautiful girl I went to. I walked up to her and I said, if I would design a woman, she'd look like you. She came back and slept over. The first shot. First shot, beginner's luck. <laughs> then, well, all commodity traders are successful, are compulsive. So then I went to ugly girls. And I found out I didn't do quite as well with ugly girls as pretty girls. But I actually made counts because that's what works. Beyond the probability, there's something else you're bringing up there too, which is to approach a beautiful woman who is often not approached, people don't realize that, she might like that attitude you're bringing. She likes that moxie that you're bringing. Well, she's horny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. And I saw that. I actually wanted to talk to you about Amazon. You're talking about horny girls. You want to talk about Amazon, but you're talking about being horny and girls. I can't control you. <laughs> <laughs> I can go so anyway, because I, there was the article that you wrote, was in an interview, and it was to Jeff Bezos is a cross the board trader. A trend follower. A trend follower. Well, I thought about that, and it's true. I'm 80 next April, and I was telling my friend Max, I've had maybe two losing years. One of them was because the people that man who I like and loved and made a lot of money with wanted to take the leverage up. That was not a good idea. Trend following is great. It's made me who I am. I'm an Aspen in the biggest suite in the hotel. But trend following has always worked for me. And when I read your article, I looked at what Bezos had going for him. First of all, he didn't have to put up any money. You're looking puzzled, but he really didn't. Hold on, I'm looking puzzled? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is like the first video interview that I have ever done for the podcast. Really? True. It's easier to do audio, because video, you have to set all this stuff up, but Zoom is making it easy now. They didn't have to. Michael Dell saw this right from his room in college. The kid who bought the computer from him uses that, his credit card. Bezos and that guy, and now almost everybody, gets paid before the delivery. I couldn't figure out them at all. I'm a really good company because Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and Larry Height, and I was with a guy today, none of us could figure out what Peter was doing. He built his infrastructure for speed. He didn't have to put out money. It was really, but it took me years to figure that out. Larry, you're making the case that essentially being a good entrepreneur is being a trend follower and being a trend follower is being a good entrepreneur. Well, who are the richest people around? They follow trends. I mean, no one gets to be Jeff Bezos rich unless something big comes from nowhere and goes to the moon. Correct. If I may tell you, I work with this incredible guy. He went to Wharton. He was all on scholarship, both as a football player and as a scholar. He's just one of those annoying people. I told him about the 52-week high. He came out to Colorado to visit me because his wife was prepping the house to sell in Texas, big university there. His wife says, go visit Larry. So they come in and he says, hey, it worked. Well, I say so much bullshit. I said, what? What he did was he took the 52 week high and if it dropped down 5%, he got out. 
the first time. If it went back up, he got in. He was wrong 85% of that time. 85%. He turned $1 million in the simulation into 20. 20. Average 20% a year. You know from the book I read, which is pure David Ricardo. Get rid of your losses. And that's why I called it the rule. For average people, if you got 85% losers, for average people, that's disappointing. If you have average psychology, average understanding of the markets, 85% losses sounds frightening, horrifying to the average person. If they don't have Larry Height's superpowers, it sounds terrible. But no, Larry Height was lucky enough. You visited my house, you know. I have a computer. My friend did that with a small computer. First of all, he's a multimillionaire to begin with. So he was doing it just to see if what I said worked. And he's mathematic. He knows the law of large numbers. He wanted to test you? No, he just... One of these rare people who's a man of action, real good athlete, scholarship, and he does. Where other people talk, he does. How does he, how does you, maybe myself in some ways, how do you get around disappointment? How do you take a, an average person who doesn't have your lucky experience, as you call it, and get around disappointment? Because I went with a guy. Do you know Harold, Harold Janine? He's head of life. I do not. Billionaire. He invites me to lunch. I'm 30. He met me through another friend. And he says to me, I mean, he's now like, he could have been my grandfather. He says to me, Larry, he bought telephone companies all over the effing world. He said, buying companies, Larry, is not like going to the movies. Now, I'm sitting with a billionaire. I don't want to be a dummy, but I'm not making the connection between movies and buying companies. So I say, Harold, I'm a little slow here. Could you wind back and explain this to me? He said, Larry. You go to the movies, you buy a ticket, and then you sit down in the movie, and you sit there till the movie ends. He says, when I buy a company, before I give the money, I have to know how the end is going to be. We can take a computer, and we can make a database. We can test. Once you have that, I'm sitting here with my friend Max. He does a lot of nice things for me, but he won't take any money. I'm showing him how to do counts. Before I do something, I've done thousands of counts. So I don't have to have courage. I just have to know to add. Let's face it, Mike, you know most of the top players. Very few people need great mathematical skill to do the trend following. I mean, you got to add, divide, and know how to do probability. How many guys have you spoke to use calculus? To be a trend follower? Yeah. None. Surely some of them know how to do it exactly, but it's not relevant to what they're doing with their trading. Right. Any 12-year-old kid could do all the math necessary. Probably an eight-year-old, because it's averages, probability, and most of all, risk management. That's why you're here today, right? Having been dyslexic, blind, and one eye, half blind, another idea, I'd be either a broken-down comedian or a floor washer. Hold on, let's, let's see. If you did not have risk management, you would be a broken down comedian or a floor washer. That is a fantastic quote. 
from one of the best trend following traders, a broken down comedian or floor washer. But you got to see what it is. You learn these things. Look, you and I are very good friends. One of the most fun people I ever speak to. Yes, it was one time I called you by mistake at four o'clock in the morning here. And then I was sort of, I really wanted to go to sleep. You remember this incident. But I was so embarrassed. But hold on, I'm on the other side of the planet. So for me, it was the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> That's why I started it. But you and I are very good friends because of communication, right? What kind of communication? Well, I don't know. We talked about everything. We talked about your thing in politics. I remember you were a catcher. You talk trash talk all the time. I never talk any shit, Larry. <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn, and most of you people who aren't from New York sound to us Brooklyn people like you're talking shit all the time. I got to tell you, as you're saying this, though, when I first started to come to New York, maybe in the, I don't know, early 2000s, I think, something, been there maybe once or twice, but once I started to get friends from New York, it's a really interesting thing because for most of my life, people are pretty tame. The Washington, D.C. area, people are pretty middle of the road. I've got a salty tongue. I'll drop the F-bombs. I'll say that stuff. Then when I get to New York, I get to New York and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, okay, my tribe has been up here all along hiding from me. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you a test I did. I think I must have told you this before. So I'm doing what I was. My group was the first billion dollar across the board trade to reach a billion dollars. A fund. A CTA commodity fund. Yeah. Peter, my main partner, said, we have a great system. I said, no. I said, but what do you mean? I said, oh. Alex Grazerman, who I'm still very good friends, and we own a lot of real estate together. I get Alex in. I said, here's what I want you to do. We're doing 3,200 trades a year. Set up a random number generator that will pick the what to trade, what to, when to get in. But one thing that couldn't be random was when to get out. So random trades, random entry, and a hard stop. Correct. So I do this, and it comes out better than our system, right? I thought that was really interesting. And I have a philosophy called leverage, asymmetrical leverage. Think about a stop. When you go in and buy a new high, just to say, you put your stop in, or even better than that, you buy a call. You know exactly what you're going to lose, but you don't know how much you're going to make. It was an asymmetrical bet. You could lose $2, and you could have bought Amazon and gone up 500%. Hey, let me keep you at that point with the fund with Alex and the random system. So you have Alex put together a random system, random entry, random market selection, a fixed hard stop. It does better than the fund that you are promoting to all these clients that has raised a billion dollars and you're sitting here in the office looking at a random system and you know it's better, but because of the way the fund management world works, you can't really tell your client base, we've got this random system because they won't buy it. Right, but I had learned something very better than money. I learned how to bet, and I learned the fallacy of a magic way. The magic way is getting yourself into a position, and every entrepreneur, I don't care who it was, who makes real money, 
gets into a position where they can lose a small amount and make a big amount. That's the game. It's exactly what Bezos says. If he tries a product and it doesn't work, he gets rid of it. Now, just look, because of the law, various mathematical laws, not everybody is going to become Bezos. That's not the issue. The issue is for your life, can you do much better in your life? Maybe you'll be the next Bezos, but probably not. But can you do much better in your life with his strategy than not? And the answer is clearly yes. Yeah. I'll tell you a story. So we have his friend, two friends, meet at the Aspen Idea Festival, which is something I tell you, you got to do. It's the only place I've ever been where consistently the audience is as smart as smarter than worldwide expert. That's the place. I come here, meet these people. He's a doctor retired surgeon, she runs a big educational company. Surgeons are by nature picky people. You want a surgeon to look very carefully at what he's doing. Very precise people. He builds her a portfolio. Becomes worth a couple million dollars. She's in a beauty parlor. The women are in a panic over the disease, the virus. They're all going to sell this stock. Let me set this up really quick, though, Larry. So you got the friend. She knew somebody who was smart, helped her get a portfolio. The portfolio is many millions of dollars. And she goes to the beauty shop. All the ladies are worried about COVID. And now she wants to sell. And she sells everything but the gold. So her husband, he said, I'm out of managing your money. I spent years doing this. I made you rich. I am not going to F this again. She calls me up, says, Larry, what do I do with the gold? And she calls me several times. I said, well, you want to know the real truth? Sell the gold and buy Amazon. Why did I say this? Gold can only do three things. It can go up, it can go down, or it can stand still. The one thing you can possibly make more money power is it goes up faster than inflation. Because with trillions of dollars worth of debt, the only sensible thing the United States can do be keep as a world leader, it cannot default on the debt. So if you're not defaulting on the debt, what's the most intelligent thing to do? Inflate out. You inflate out, you're still a leader. The whole thing about money is buying power. Now, listen, if you're wrong here, if you're wrong on this economic political prescription, you've got a stop loss. I mean, your ego is not here. If you're saying this is how it can unfold and it doesn't unfold that way, you're prepared to go the other way. Always. I'm not here to prove I'm a guru. Do this because I said, I'd rather have a thousand bets than one bet. There are many ways for Jeff Bezos to win. There's only one way for the goal to win. That it outpaces inflation. It's the only way. If it keeps up with play, if it keeps up with inflation, you're nowhere. You know what's funny about gold? How many people, Larry, in the last, let's say, 40 years or whatnot, are still influenced by that 1979, 1980 gold move? They always just think that that exact same thing is going to happen. That keeps so many people fixated on gold. And that's why I had a good friend of mine who is a very good arbitrager. I'm on the phone with him. Silver is very high. He says, well, you know, it can't go down. I said, I don't see why it can't go down. Why is it written? That's... And he gave me 20 facts. I said, 
Well, it's dropped below the 30-day low. So clearly, it can go down because there it was down. That's a fact. Look, I'm talking to my friend Max two days ago because he set this all up for me. Without him, I would not. And I said, I like numbers more than charts, but I started out as a chartist. The market tells you stuff, it really does. If you fail to make a new high and the next low is lower than the previous high, that's going down. The market is right there on paper. Failed one, went lower than the next low. I only have one eye, but I could see that. It's not, I like numbers. Because with numbers, I could do probabilities. I'm on a plane with somebody, sitting in first class. She tells me, she is in New York. She got adopted by, after the war, rabbis in New York went to the builders and said there's a lot of Jewish, or they think it's Jewish, orphans. She was adopted by a New York builder. When it was all over, she is worth a half a billion dollars. She says, I'm putting half of it in gold in Switzerland. I said, look, if they start throwing atomic bombs around, how the fuck are you going to get to Switzerland? Yeah, no, hold on. In her defense, atomic bombs at Switzerland so far has not happened. So far. Look, you spend a lot of time in Chicago, or you used to. Right. Chicago has a lot of murders. In Chicago, it's very easy to buy a gun on the street. The gun of choice in the last couple of years is a Glock. You ever shoot a Glock? I have. Very fast gun. It's almost like a machine gun. You put one the trigger, brrr, take a 15-year-old boy with no father and a mother who works three jobs and a Glock, and the only family he has is other 15-year-old boys. Boys, go Glocks, equal murder. Because you're 15 years old, you don't know what you're doing, but you have this incredibly fast weapon. Certain things happen. So if you start to throw one bomb around, or several, very bad shit's going to happen. Your point there with the atomic bombs in Switzerland and whatnot is to get people to think about what's the worst case scenario. Because we did not think at one point in time that Chicago would have dozens of people dying per day and now they're out there robbing on the Magnificent Mile. So things that we can never imagine can happen, is your point. Yeah. Look, what's the most common thing in the markets? Crazy. No. You know the most common thing? The most fundamental thing. Most fundamental thing in the markets are people. If you don't have people, you don't have a market. Well, people are crazy, though. Yeah, people, well, but they're a special kind of crazy. People are herd animals, like sheep or cattle. When you say that, though, if you think about it, people are like herd animals, like sheep, like cattle. That's another strike of the ego, isn't it? But it happens to be true. It's true. Years ago, Larry, when you were in my film, I actually went to a sheep farm to film those sheep for this very same reason and to watch hundreds of sheep running together and they were so frightened and it was the most, it didn't translate well to film, but in person, it was amazing to watch. Yeah, and it's scary. And that's what happens. We have a mayor in New York City who's really stupid, really stupid and really corrupt and lazy. The lazy is his best trait because he does fewer stupid things. He decided to defund the police. 
the real street police. Magically, we're getting eight to 10 kills a day. I don't know what to say about it. It's what you were just saying a second ago about Chicago. How could one ever expect that all of Midtown Manhattan would be closed? They would be stealing at sacks. They would be defacing the churches. There would be violence everywhere. You've lived in New York for so long. You've got a great place there. Back to the lady example that wanted to put the gold in Switzerland. Your point is, imagine it. It can happen. Because it does. Crazy things happen. Crazy things happen. All the good managers in our business are not bold, crazy people. They are very good risk takers. By the way, I'll tell you a great Ed Sakota story. I had a partner who hit a trade, comes into our lawyer's office and says, I'm going to tell you something that I'm going to jump out the window. Okay. He hid his trade. He was the inside guy. I was the outside guy. So I had to go home and tell my wife that we could be bankrupt. As it turned out, I turned it around. This is a great kind of a Jewish story. I was brought up as most immigrants. You notice there are immigrant neighborhoods in every major city because they all flock to where they know people. I was brought up and told since I was three years old that it was my job to support my parents and my grandparents. Couldn't argue with that because my father supported his mother, my mother's mother, and my rich uncle put everybody in the family chipped in to help us. My Italian friends all bought a house. Three generations would go in. My father got an apartment for my grandmother. So this was my job. I'm an only child to support them. Considering I was shitty at school, shitty at sports, I knew I had to be rich. So that was my goal. That's what I had to do. And in Brooklyn, the mafia was considered like the Knights of Columbus. The good guys. It's how the world was. Yeah, that's right. You can't today, if you haul garbage from a manufacturer, you can only haul it from the guy who works that thing. You didn't get it hauled by them. You get a dump back on your stairs. The unions, the union guys knew my father's business as well as he did. The guy would come to George, you got a problem. They want to have a strike. And they knew that my father's absolute time that he had to be open, otherwise he missed the season. But I tell you, you know, George, you're a friend of mine. I always liked you. I think I could get this settled for you for $10,000. Was my father angry? No. My father said to me, that's the cost of doing business. And that's the world I grew up in. My father wasn't a criminal. But if he wanted to get something done, I had to do that. I always knew that it was my job to support him. No matter what, I support a cousin. I give her $10,000 a year, which one thing she has to promise is me that she won't call me because she's so depressing to talk to. (laughs) You're so bad. Hey, I got to tell you on the union story to share one back with you. Early 20s, mid 20s, I was assisting one of those conference events that you used to attend in Chicago. And it was at one of the fancy hotels downtown Chicago. John Henry was speaking. This is before the speech. So I'm in an empty hall with a couple organizers and we're kind of setting things up before everybody comes in. And someone looked at me and they said, Mike, 
walk over there and turn the lights on over on the side of the hall. Now, there's probably like a thousand people going this hall. So I start to walk over to turn the lights on. Some guy starts screaming at me, don't you dare touch that light switch. Only a union member could turn those lights on. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Now, I thought it was stupid. I still think it was stupid. But the reality is, even if something's dumb, it can still be real. And if it's real, it's the cost of doing business. And if it's the cost of doing business, don't argue with the cost of doing business. Just do the damn business because we can't solve everything in life. Right. Exactly. I called my father and I said, look, I got a problem. I owe $7 million more than I have. And my father says to me, no, Larry, you don't have the problem. The guy you own the money to has the problem. He framed it in a different way. Yeah. I go in to see the guy. He's a bond trader. And he starts to talk tough to me. New Yorkers don't know how to talk that way, any other way. So the guy starts to walk towards me. I turn to him and say, stop. The best thing you could do is kill me. So I am not afraid of you at all. The worst thing he can do is kill you. No, it would be best. I'd solve all the fucking problems. Right? But he won't have his money if you're dead. There's no money if you're dead. <laughs> That's what I explained to him. The only way you get paid if I can convince these other guys to put more money in. He, being a southerner, but very bright guy, he says, yeah, what are we going to do? His partner walks in. It's the coolest thing. He started with the tough guy. Routine. He turned to his partner and said, Larry and I did that dance already. I worked it out. I think what you're giving is kind of a, a lesson of thinking about how to frame issues, to solve problems, and to try and take the emotion to the side. And if you can put the emotion to the side, there's a way to get both sides to where they can best get for that point in time. Sometimes emotions work. But under real pressure, they might not work. But when you're an across-the-board trader, I could trade anything. I think this guy is a really smart guy. But we have to, as good traders, control our emotions. There's no better way to control your emotions than have a method. Because then you know what to do. When I thought I was going broke, do you remember the King Biscuit Flower Hour? I do, all the rock bands. Right. My cousin put that together, invented that. I knew a woman named Mary Alberti. She went to Wharton. She was very smart. I was feeling very depressed because of my partner and what to do. She said, oh, I have a friend you should talk to, Ed Zakota. So I called Ed Zakota up. She had called. He said, I could see you two Thursdays from now at 1 o'clock. I go into the King Biscuit Flower studio. My cousin gives me a studio and a mic so I could be clear. And Ed Dakota, and he says to me, look, it's a really simple business. Decide how much you're willing to lose and go with the trend. I knew that. I've done more simulations than the years the Jewish people have lived, more than 5,000 simulations. So he was telling me something that I knew, and I felt great. He's a really magical guy in that kind of a way. He's a magical guy in all kinds of ways. Remember, it was I think it was 2012. Gosh, time flies, right? 2012, you, me, Ed on stage in Chicago. That was quite fun. And with his guitar. Yeah. Banjo, banjo. <laughs> a banjo. I said, 
And he said, look, it doesn't matter. You could have a 2% stop, 5% stop, a 10 but you got to keep to the discipline. That just, I knew that. I knew that as well as anybody. I was always thankful to him for that. And it was certainly an honor to be with him. I think I met him for the first time in 2001. Look, I mean, he's a man too, so he puts his pants on. He learned a lot of interesting things from interesting people too. So I guess the fun thing is, is that he, he put a lot of work in, he put a lot of time in, but then he's also given back to tell other people what he's learned. Yeah, well, look, you'll understand this. I figure out a way. I'm 80 years old, April. A youngster, a teenager. I was at a guy's house for lunch before I am, who's 99. He's a really interesting guy and a billionaire. Mutual friend thought we'd have a good time together, and we did. We had a lot of fun. And he had done a lot of interesting stuff. So he invited me back to a club. I could learn a lot from him. Do you know why Buffett brought Berkshire Hathaway? I assume because he knew that that particular company would make a nice vehicle for other plans that he had. And again, I'm going a little bit from memory here. And that ultimately, this notion of acquiring insurance businesses, that this would all work well in that structure. Yes, because he didn't want to buy it. Textile was failing, but they had NOLs. So he used the NOLs not to pay taxes, which is in no book. But I was talking to one of the guys who put it together, the 99-year-old guy. And he used NOL. We think about it. You could see... Define for the audience NOL so everyone's following along. Losses, previous losses, not used. Prior losses on the books that you can use currently. Buffett never says this in public, but the merger gave him all his tax-free earnings. So it wasn't a surprise a couple of years later. He got fully out of the textile business. He was using the NOLs. You wouldn't have known that. I went to the, I never read it anywhere. But this guy told me the real story. And I could see it because I'll tell you my quick Buffett story. Do you remember Adam Smith? Of course. Wealth of Nations. No, that is a great book. No, Adam Smith was a Jewish guy who used Adam Smith's name because he didn't want to give out his name. He was on public television introducing Buffett. Now, I'm sitting there. I was doing very well for me at my age. I'm saying to myself, I'm making a couple hundred grand a year. I'm a kid. I say, why don't I understand the word this guy is saying? I know he's saying something important. I don't understand what he's saying. But I could see he was smart. Maybe this would be a smart thing for me to learn. So I knew I could not get the trades from the partnership. But Berkshire had been in business for 20 years buying stocks. I got the list of every stock he bought and the date. And then I went to Value Line and I bought the page and the date and the print of everything he bought. And I got three guys who were like me, said, I'm going to find out what he did. And after a while, I was buying his stocks before they were announced because I saw what he was doing. I didn't go any further than that because I figured out that if Warren Buffett magically said to me, Larry, I'm going to give you 
everything that I know. I came to the conclusion that his knowledge was a 10 gallon nut pail. And I had a five gallon pill. So if he gave me all his knowledge, five gallons are gonna go on the floor. So I took what I thought were his most important things and I used them. And the way he looked at it, he looked at it in an equation, not like an algorithm. He takes the cash flow after tax on top, takes the price of the stock plus the debt. What was his after tax yield? How long did it last? And that's exactly what you would do if you were buying a business. And I said, that's the key to his wealth was compounding. So I bought 11 stock, Berkshire Hathaway. Today, I had $11,000 of stock because I still wasn't sure. Today, that's $300,000 a share. Uh, but it took me a long time because I knew he was smarter than me, that that was apparent. I put it away. And a lot of people who do trends don't trend the right things. I could see his cash flow growing. So that was one of the things that I looked at even more than the price. And he was winning. I stayed. Then I had, this is really weird, I had too much money in my IRA or whatever it was. I bought more Berkshire, the bees, and I let him keep going. That grew into millions of dollars. But I was trend following all the time. I was not only trend following the price, I was following the cash flow. I was trend following, but anyway, it was an interesting thing that you could take cash flow, you could break down parts of company, see how each part was performing, where was the money coming from, and where was it going. So this guy, Mike Covell, I'm teaching the Alex Resumen once a year, Kids always ask questions. I took your podcast, walked into the room, turned it on, and said, sit there. You're going to learn something. My podcast. Your podcast of the Jeff Bezos is a trend follower. Do you know how long, if you're a brand new person to my podcast, I think I crunched it, counting up the hours, I think it would take 30 days listening, 24 and seven to listen to the entire podcast now. That's how many hours there are. A month. You just sit down and put the headphones on and listen for a month, nothing else. 24 seven. That's crazy. No, it's not. I don't think it's crazy, but I look back on it eight years later, you're like a lot of, a lot of content. But you have very smart people in the interview. And you're a good, and so it's like getting an MBA. Sometimes, and it's not all finance. Yeah, have a lot diverse. Right to me, like another degree. If I, I was on a bike in the gym, I had my cell phone, but I didn't have earphones. So I'm in the gym and there's a girl behind me. So I'm playing it to hear this thing and I'm riding on the bike. I say to her, I hope I didn't disturb you. And she said, oh, far be it. That's the most interesting bike ride I ever had. Hold on, you were listening to my podcast. And she's overhearing me. And some hot girl is listening to the podcast. Right. She's not even interested in you. She's interested in the guy who's on the podcast talking. <laughs> Who your guest was, whatever. 
I just said, gee, this is really great. This is really, I don't get to hear this stuff. I remember that. Uh, because you do a good job in what you're doing. And it's interesting. If somebody went and listened to 800 of those things, <laughs> they would have a very good education about the world because of the verse of people. You really do have Nobel Prize winners. You do have very good traders. And I think there is a lot of, and you saw them life lessons that come from being what it takes to be a trader. Self-mastery, study, and taking action. All the people you have know something, have done something what they know. So it makes a very good, you see a lot of people talk, very few people do. You give the combination of both. I'm very lucky right now that I get a significant number of really, really, as you talk about, kind of accomplished people, interesting people. And it somewhat feeds on itself now. I mean, I have a lot of publishers and PR firms, et cetera, are always saying, hey, what do you think about this person? What do you think about that person? I mean, they came to me in the last couple of years and said, hey, do you want to have Howard Marks on, billionaire? Do you want to have Tom Golisano on, who started Paychecks, billionaire? I mean, I'm just kind of hanging out and you get a chance to talk to all these interesting people. It's great. I think so. Just like you today, Larry and Aspen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and hopefully Larry doesn't get fried in action. <laughs> this state is on fire. My friends from Vail came to visit us. Guy is very good top money manager, was president of the Philharmonic, New York Philharmonic, very smart, a guy, great wife, just terrific person. So they drive here, two hour drive, seven hours to come home because of smell. You know, it's bad. You must come to the Ideas Festival. Once I can get out of Corona Asia travel bans right now, they've really made getting around difficult internationally. James Altucher, an author I know who I respect, does nice stuff. He's a lifelong New Yorker. He wrote a really interesting piece the other day, and he basically said he loves New York. He's got businesses, New York family, everything. But he wrote an interesting piece, and he said, and I'm paraphrasing, New York is dead and it's not coming back. Well, I hope not. But I will tell you, the best thing about the mayor is that he's lazy. That's the best you can say about him. I mean, he can't mess up things even more, perhaps. Yes. His wife, who he made something, can't give an accounting of $700 million on projects. When asked about that, her response was, there are always negative people. You've got a great place in New York City. You love the city. Does my friend, does he have a point? If things got in so bad, so many people leaving, I mean, all the stores are boarded up. There's like 10% of the people that would normally come to those towers or in New York City have things shifted in such a way that it's going to take a very, very long time to get back. I don't know. There's a guy named Cohn who owns a lot of New York real estate. He wants to get the mayor out. He's willing to put a million dollars behind that. I am now a Florida resident. That says something right there, right? Right. Will you keep your place in New York? Yes, but I have to be out of New York City. Tax rules, like half the year or something? Half a year. 
I've already kept you longer than I was supposed to. The book that everyone needs to check out, The Rule, How I Beat the Odds in the Markets and in Life and How You Can Too, Larry Height. People have to check that out. Larry, now that we're on Zoom, man, this is like we're next door neighbors. Yes, we are. And that's nice. <laughs> really? Seriously? If this is your 800th. You are going to be number 900. 900. Well, okay, great. I like talking to you. I talk to you when we're not on. I mean. I wish we had some of these crazy conversations that we've had when we weren't on. But we didn't know if they allow them on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the producer. Anything can go on. Hey, listen, you go enjoy your night. We'll catch up soon, sir. Okay. By the way, you look really great. You look good too. We're, we're like two male models right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Larry, take care. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.